war has devastating effects. You think about the effect that it has on nations, on cultures, on families, on economies. Think about how it is in war that it can take generations to overcome the challenges and the struggles that may have resulted because of that war. And whether we realize it or not, we're at war today. Not speaking of a war with any other nation, but rather speaking of a war that's taking place spiritually. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 tells us, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3 tells us that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. It's not the case that we're fighting with weapons and with guns and with all of these other things that war takes place with today, but instead we're fighting a war of our own decisions, a war of our own choices. And it has an impact on us. It doesn't take long for us to see whether it's in our own family or just simply in the community around us. The way that this war has an impact on our own homes, on our own relationships, in our own families. War has devastating effects. And the war that we fight spiritually is no different. Now we might think when we speak of this idea of of being at war with worldliness... Generally, when we think about worldliness, we often think of, a, of a, a big sin, if you will. We think about worldliness and the idea of something such as murder or, or something such as adultery, and we could go on and on and on. But worldliness is far less than that, if you will. Worldliness is simply us placing anything, ourself, our own decisions, our own choices, ahead of God. You see, the war that we are fighting is a war of constant choice, of constant decision, of of constant action, of on which side of the line are we going to stand? Are we going to stand on God's side, or are we going to stand on the world's side? And if it is the case that we find ourselves standing on the world's side, well, we need to realize the devastation. We need to realize the danger that comes by being an ally of the world. Because there are going to be problems that arise. There are going to be struggles and challenges and and difficulties that result because of standing with the world. In the first place it is in James chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 that we might recognize that devastation. That we might see those problems is in the way that we war against our brethren. Look again in the passage that Jared read for us just a moment ago, out of James chapter 4 and verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now remember who it is that James writes to in this particular letter. You go all the way back to James chapter 1, and what we find is that James is not writing to the world, but instead James is writing to Christians. James is writing to the body of Christ Jesus. Yet even within the body, what did James see? War and fighting. It's a sad truth and a sad reality that still at times happens today. We are the people of God. We are to be united in Christ Jesus. But unfortunately at times, what we find are these wars and these fights. And why is it that these wars and fights take place? Why is it that we find this conflict in the world, but even more so in the body of Christ Jesus? It's because of our own desires. It's because, as James says there, our own desires for pleasure. We know what it is that we want. We know what it is that we desire. And so we don't care what anybody else thinks as long as we get what we want. You see, this line of thinking, of thinking only for self, if we go back up in the text to James chapter 3, and if we look in James chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, it says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. 
For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. The goal should be that we be united. That we all be of the same mind, that there be no divisions among us. That's what Paul would tell the brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul pleads with the brethren to be of one mind, to be of one accord. Well, why did he need to plead so strongly? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 11, word had gotten to Paul that there were contentions among the brethren, that there were wars and fights going on within the congregation there in Corinth. And as we've mentioned, unfortunately, those wars and fights can still happen today. We all have our opinions. We all have our desires of what's going to be the most pleasing to ourselves. What should the order of worship be? Not speaking of the acts themselves, but how should it be conducted? How should the order be? What songbooks should we use? Should we use one cup? Should we use multiple cups? How should we decorate the building, or should we even decorate it at all? All of these things that in the end really don't matter, but far too often we think they matter more than they do. And so we bicker and we argue and we fight and we war, and suddenly we have a division in the congregation that's not solved in one generation, not always solved in two generations, but at times can take multiple generations to resolve until eventually we forget what it is that our family was mad about in the first place. You see, if we're not careful, and if we start thinking more about what's pleasing to myself than what it might be to my own brethren, suddenly a war can begin. Suddenly a fight can begin. And we see the devastation that takes place within the congregation. But whenever we're on the side of worldliness, it's not just problems that we'll see or or devastation in the congregation among our brethren, but we will see it even within ourselves. You look again in verse 1 and you see why the problems arise in the first place. And it's because of the desires that I have for pleasure. It's because of our own individual desires that we prefer over others that these problems begin. And really all of the problems originate with self. You go back to James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 and we see where it is that sin and ultimately death are going to come from. It's because of our own temptations, our own desires. And when we give in to our own temptations, to our own desires, James 1, 14 and 15 says, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, if I'm living in the ways of the world, if I'm living for myself, I am going to find problem after problem. In James chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You see, what we have at the end of verse 2 is a situation where we are not valuing God. Where what we're doing is trusting in ourself, in our own desire, in our own opinion, and so we don't take our worries and our cares before God. You do not have because you do not ask. But sometimes we can fool ourselves. Sometimes we can believe that we're being religious, that just because we're here amongst the brethren, that that we're not dealing with the issues of worldliness. But you look at James 4 and verse 3. Well, maybe now you ask, but you do not receive. Because James says you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You find the problems because we want things for ourselves. We find the problem because we're elevating ourselves before God. We find problems within our life because we're thinking only about ourselves and because we're allowing ourselves to be deceived by the world. It's something that happens to every single one of us. And whenever the problems arise in our lives, it can be a challenge. It can be a struggle to recognize why it is I have found myself in the situation I'm in. 
why I have these problems with my brethren, why these problems are going on at home, why it is I'm in the state that I am before my God. Because in James chapter 4 and verse 4, we find that if we're on the world's side, that even more so if we're living for ourselves, it's not only going to create problems within the congregation, it's not only going to create problems within my own life, but it's going to create problems between me and my God. Notice what James says there in James 4 and verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. That's pretty shocking. I mean, how many of us would want to be called adulterers and adulteresses? Nobody raises their hand. Yet James says if we're living in the ways of the world, if we're living only to please ourselves... James says, you are an adulterer. You are an adulteress. But why is that the case? Remember that James is writing to Christians, to those who had already obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, to those who would have believed they're in that right relationship with God. But James says, based on the way they were living, they were being unfaithful to God. You see, we don't always think about our spiritual faithfulness In the same sense, we think about marital faithfulness. None of us would make a vow to our own spouse and then in our right minds, thinking we're still being faithful, step out on them and cheat on our spouse. But what does James say that we're doing? If we make a commitment to our God, if we are Christians and we decide to step out on our God with the world, James says adulterers and adulteresses. He goes on there in James 4 and verse 4 to say, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We cannot have it both ways. We can't decide on a Sunday or a Wednesday that we're going to be faithful to God. But then every other day of the week, We're going to step out on him and be friends with the world. It's not how it works. In fact, one writer would say that to do something such as this is to be like a mouse being friendly to a mouse trap, or like a deer being friendly to a hunter. You can't come close to fire and not expect to walk away smelling like smoke. Yet we do it all the time. Oh, we think that that it's not going to affect us. And so we'll just come close to the line. I know that what's going on there is not good, but I'm not going to partake in it. I'm not going to, to, to be involved in what everybody else there is involved in. And so we push the line. Oh, I know that it's not going to affect my kids. My kids are are strong spiritually, and they love Jesus. They know Jesus, and they they study their Bibles, but uh, I want them to have this experience. And so we send them in. We push the line, and we expect nothing to happen. But far too often, if we're honest, what happens We walk away smelling like smoke. Adulterers and adulteresses. It's shocking that James would call the brethren that. But sometimes it takes something that straightforward for us to realize what it is that we're doing when we live more for ourselves, when we live more for the world than we do for our God. And so if we can recognize the devastation that's caused through this war with the world, and we're looking to refocus and to get back on the right side of the battle, we need to remember our purpose. We need to remember our why. You think about those who would fight in a war even still today, and even throughout history, those who always have the better chance and the better advantage generally speaking, are going to be those who have a purpose 
who have a clear reason in mind as to why it is they are fighting for the cause that they are fighting for. And if we're to be at war with this world, with the ways of the world, to be at war even with Satan, then brethren, we have to remember our why. You keep looking in the text at what James goes on to say, even especially in verse 5. How it is in James 4 and verse 5, we see that our God desires us. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now keep the context in mind. You look back in verse 4 and you see that idea of adulterers and adulteresses. In verse 5, we now see the unique and special desire and interest that God has in those who are His children. We could think back in our study in the book of Romans to Romans chapter 8, where we find there that idea how the Spirit of God dwells in us. You can think about Acts 2.38, Galatians 4 and verse 6, and you see that there is something there for the child of God and the Spirit of God. And when we obey Him, God shows us that desire He has, that interest He has for us in giving us His Holy Spirit. And so now, if it is the case that we think we can cross the line, that we can push it a little further, and a little further, and a little further, and we can find ourselves living in the ways of the world, do you think the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now, it's interesting whenever we look in and we try to find what it is that James is quoting from. We know being Scripture that he's pointing to somewhere in the Word of God. And what it seems like James is doing is not quoting a, a Scripture necessarily, but rather quoting an idea we find from the Scripture, the way that these individuals would have understood it. And so we think back to the book of Exodus. And perhaps we think about those Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and specifically in verse 5, where you shall have no other gods before me. And why is that the case? Because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now apply this to understanding that whenever we are Christians, we in a sense are married to our God. How many of us would be pleased with our spouse if they were to cheat on us? There's a little bit of jealousy there. It's a healthy jealousy. But think about how God feels. The one who has given us His Spirit, when it is that we go and live like the world, He doesn't like it. He wants us to be His. He wants us to live for Him. But far too often we don't. Far too often we live for self and we live for the world. And we would think at that point, how could God ever take us back? You think about even within the world today at times when it is that adultery takes place. At times it might be that one spouse receives the other back, but it's not always so. And that's a hard thing to do and a challenging thing uh, to be able to, uh, to even fathom. But you know what we find in James 4 and verse 6? But God gives more grace. When it is that we have messed up, our God is gracious to us. When it is we find ourselves fighting on the other side and realize we need to come back, God is gracious to us. And He is willing to bring us back to His side, to the winning side. And so we look in James 4 and verse 6 but He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Paul quotes here from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. And if you look in Proverbs 3 and verse 34, rather than saying the proud, it might say there uh, the scornful, that God scorns the scornful, but He gives grace to the humble. Well, what the Proverbs writer is saying, what James is telling us, what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us through the Word is the fact that God's grace is seen not in our stubbornness, not in our pride, not when we live for ourselves, but God's grace is seen when it is 
that we humble ourselves. When it is that we are ashamed for our actions. When it is that we realize what we have done and how it is that we have crossed the line and gone against our God. He's gracious. He's willing to forgive. He wants to help us. You might think about a passage such as Hebrews 4 and verse 16. But let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But how challenging can that be when it is we have become those adulterers and adulteresses of James 4 and verse 4? But God gives more grace. 1 John 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sin, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When it is we have been unfaithful to our God, our God is faithful to us. That if we will humble ourselves, recognizing our fault, recognizing our shame, and if we will go to Him and seek His forgiveness, He gives more grace. He will lift us up. And James thankfully explains what it takes. James explains to us what that humility looks like. And so if we look in what follows in James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, we find the way that we can be successful in the war with worldliness is to turn to our God. Really, James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 is, is New Testament commentary on Proverbs 3 and verse 34. And we understand this based on how, how James begins the section in verse 7 by saying, Therefore, it's because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble that we must turn to God. Which means verse 7 in the first part of James chapter 4 and verse 8, we must give ourselves entirely to Him. You look at what James has to say when he says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. If it is the case that we will submit ourselves to God, meaning that we recognize his authority, that we recognize his power, and we will place ourselves under his control and follow his commands through this war, then it makes sense that we will resist the devil. To resist the devil means that we are going to stand in complete opposition to him. It's not the case that we're going to just kind of straddle the line and say, well, you know, I can kind of be here today, but tomorrow I can be here, and, and I'm not going to be all in on the side of the world, so it's okay if I just, you know, hug that line a little bit closer. If I resist the devil... I'm in complete opposition to him. I want nothing to do with him. Which is why, James 4 and verse 8, I draw near to God. If the devil is here, I'm going to be over here with my God. I am going to be where my God is, drawing nearer to him, living like him and looking more like him every day. And in the process, I know that he'll draw nearer to me, that he'll continue to protect me that He'll be able to protect me as I look for the protection in my spouse, that I know He's going to be faithful to me, that I know that He is gracious to me and He will hold me close and He will protect me through the battle. But I have to be willing to give myself to Him. More than giving myself to God in order to truly turn to Him, I need to repent of worldliness. Look at the latter part of verse 8 on into verse 9. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. A lot of the language that's used right here is language that the prophets would use to speak of repentance. James is saying we can't have the same mindset. We can't keep thinking that we can be one way today and another way tomorrow. We can't think that we are all right with God and still continue to live for self. Still continue to do what I want over what it is that God wants. James says, cleanse your hands. That is, we need to take care of our actions. Those things that are without, those things that we do, we need to cleanse our hands of the unfaithfulness. 
But at the same time, we need to purify our hearts. It's not enough just to clean things up on the outside. But brethren, we've got to clean it up on the inside. Our hearts have to be purified that we have the right mindset. And if we have the right mindset, that's where we see verse 9. True repentance is going to be seen in every aspect of our life. You think about verse 9. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's a challenging verse. It's emotions and feelings that we don't like to feel. That we don't want to feel. But remember what James has been dealing with all in the context here. When it is that we are on the world side, we're cheating on our God. There are some shameful emotions involved in that. And if we realize what it is we've done in the world, what it is that we have done for ourselves, we think about how it is maybe those times brought great joy, and we look back on those times and we laugh and we reminisce and talk about those good old days. But James says if we've really repented, they're not the good old days at all. There should be no laughing looking back on the time we wasted, on the time we spent being unfaithful to our God. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. When we think on the time was spent away from God, we think on our time spent in the world, it shouldn't bring us joy but it should bring us great sorrow, knowing the pain that it caused our God. Which is why James 4 and verse 10 tells us, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. If it is the case that we will truly repent, if we will truly turn to God, giving ourselves entirely to Him, repenting of the worldliness, making sure that I'm not going to go back and live with the world any longer, but I'm going to stay as near to my God as I can. If I will humble myself before Him, He gives more grace. He will lift me up. And even though it is, I do not deserve to be on the winning side of this war with the world. My God will give me the victory. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 tells us if God is for us, who can be against us? But far too often, if we're honest, we're against ourselves. We're against ourselves, against our God, and against even our own brethren. Because we want to live for self. And in living for self, we're living with the world. We're fighting for the world. It shouldn't be so. And if we find ourselves living for and fighting for the world today, especially if we have already obeyed the gospel of Christ Jesus, I hope we see the urgency to make things right. I hope we realize, as James points out, that we have committed that spiritual adultery. But at the same time, I hope we see how gracious our God is, how loving our God is, that despite what it is that we might have done against Him, He wants you to come home. He wants you to stand on His side today. And if you're still fighting for the world because you've never actually obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've never actually crossed the line to God's side at all, well, we can help you with that. We can study with you. We can make sure that you're ready to repent of your sin and your unfaithfulness. That you understand what it means to confess Christ Jesus as Lord and we can help you to make sure your sins get washed away as you are baptized into Christ Jesus this very day. When it comes to the war with worldliness, brethren, there's no way we can fight on our own. We need one another. And more importantly, we need our God. And if you stand in need of anything this morning, won't you let it be known as we stand and as we sing.